Let's start by uh, telling me a little bit about, telling us a little bit about yourself. Okay. So my name is Alessandro. Uh, I am Italian, originally born in Milan. Uh, I have been living in Italy many years, then in Ireland, the States, and finally Spain. I have been working in business intelligence mostly uh, for uh, the past uh, 20 years or so. Uh, I started out uh, mm, just about 20 years ago, yes, uh, as I was working for uh, Adobe and I fell into a job that was very much uh, data intense, but like the wrong kind of data intense in which like people were expected to be uh, crossing uh, Excels uh, manually all the time. Uh, as my job was producing uh, the data, the actual reports that we would use in order to uh, do demand planning for Adobe products. And like a few weeks into the job, uh, I probably wanted to hang myself because I was doing the same reports over and over and over and over. And so I pulled out a book of Visual Basic because we are talking year 2000. And uh, I basically started to automate the whole thing uh, by using Excel macros. And that's when I discovered that I kind of enjoyed doing that and uh, that Excel came surprisingly easy to me for whatever reason. And uh, from that point on, uh, I managed to improve my productivity first and then the one of the team by doing all these sorts of automation and people across the company started to, then to ask me how I could help them with their reporting. And this became like a sort of a job within a job, you know, when I was, wasn't doing demand planning, then I was helping people with their uh, access. I took a break a few years uh, later to pursue a brief career as a professional musician. <laughs> so I spent two years uh, playing music in the States. Uh, when I was done with that, um, I came over here and I finally moved to Spain. And that's when uh, I was looking for any job really to just restart over. And uh, I scored uh, uh, a job in a small company around here in Barcelona. And that's when I started to uh, get exposed to new technologies in the business intelligence area, namely databases and uh, uh, BI tools. Back in the day, we had MicroStrategy, we had business object and that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. which is surprisingly similar to what we do today, after all. And that's when I decided that uh, that's what I wanted to do. It was like uh, everything I like to do it, but it was more structured and professionalized. So I spent the following year consulting uh, and uh, basically learning first the basics and then the advanced side of things, uh, almost always around uh, BI. And once I learned the trade, I felt comfortable enough to move out of the corporate world and look for more exciting stuff. That's when I started working with startups I changed a few since then. I work in a company called Softonic, which here back in the day was a bit, quite a big deal. It was one of the biggest uh, web properties in the world in terms of traffic. And then um, I, I moved to King in gaming uh, to work as a data scientist and mostly doing uh, big data with Hadoop. That was the stack that was working back in the day. And uh, I was uh, then approached by a small company called uh, Typeform, who were just uh, uh, growing in Barcelona and scaling after uh, getting their Series A. And I was invited to uh, build their data team and infrastructure. And that's when I realized this is really what I really wanted and enjoyed doing. Uh, I did that at uh, Typeform indeed for a few years. Then I moved on to a company called Marfil in which I didn't simply restart it over and do it again. And since I apparently didn't have enough of it, uh, for the third time around, I'm in the process of building the data infrastructure and the team at uh, Preply. And that's me. Well, that's cool. What did you play, by the way, in the two years that you were making music? Uh, yeah, I, placed, uh, I played bass guitar. Oh, bass guitar. So that's an easy job. Right, <laughs> not a lot. Uh, I think so, so uh, they're mistaken. <laughs> no, it just looks easy. Uh, yeah, we make it look easy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, cool. So, uh, and when you're building uh, data infrastructure, you mean data warehouses, data lakes? Yes. So, yes. so basically, it's uh, sort of back to the roots because I think a lot of uh, uh, the work around data engineering today is around uh, automating access to data and what do you describe in your 
in your uh, beginning of your career, right? Correct. And uh, I mean, I think it's, uh, this is basically, I broadly call it business intelligence. And uh, I would uh, go from, you know, gathering data sources, consolidating them into a data warehouse, and especially find a smart way to exploit this data and make it, make it accessible to end users all the way into business analytics. Yeah. So that's the part that to the must. And what do you find like the main challenges in this enablement of uh, enabling uh, business users or data consumers to access, uh, to access this data? Well, actually, accessibility is the greatest challenge, in my opinion, uh, and is very often an overlooked one. Uh, most companies that I observed, uh, they go through several stages. And the basic stage is a stage in which uh, users across the company stakeholders simply do not have access to the data because it sits into a data warehouse somewhere. And you know, in order to access it, you need two set of skills: technical skills, which is like you know, simply knowing SQL and knowing how to be to do your query, and especially functional skills like knowing how data is modeled and what it makes sense and what it doesn't make sense, and also how all the various metrics are defined. And you know, a data warehouse is open by definition, so uh, more often than not, it gives you a lot of room for making mistakes and especially for inventing your own definition and so building your own version of the truth, which is extremely dangerous as we know. Um, so in this kind of scenario, what happens is that most of the time, some users do access data autonomously. And uh, again, they do things that they shouldn't be doing. But like uh, most people, uh, they simply rely of, uh, on a, an army of data monkeys to just go fetch the data, elaborate it, and present it to them. And that, like, uh, it's, in my opinion, is wrong at so many levels because, you know, it creates a, a, it doesn't scale. So it definitely creates a bottleneck immediately. Uh, it seems uh, every time, you know, a user might have a question, they're going to reach out to an analyst. The analyst is going to produce an analysis and give an answer. And as soon as they give this answer back, you know, they person in question is going to have 10 questions more, you know, and so like, you know, simply saturates and you end up with a burned out uh, data scientist or analyst on one side who doesn't even understand why he needs to produce this data and what's the reasoning behind it. And a very frustrated stakeholder who doesn't get the answers they need in a, in a reasonable time because they end up going in a backlog. And so like it's going to be weeks before they get any answers. Uh, the next step uh, beyond that, the second level, is uh, replacing this uh, uh, army of data monkeys with a, a troop of uh, BI analysts who would just simply build an ad hoc dashboard for each of the situations and contexts and uh, uh, that requires analysis. And that, uh, in the end, is a slightly better version of the previous one, but it still goes through the same process uh, of, you know, like there is always going to be a backlog, there is always going to be very slow responses and iterations on uh, these dashboards. And, uh, you know, so it tends to saturate anyway. And it's also very difficult to govern because, like, you know, governance is distributed. Uh, and uh, uh, more often than not, like many choices and many definitions are implemented in each dashboard. So it's very difficult then to, you know, to reproduce them exactly the same way everywhere. And you might end up with poor governance and, uh, you know, inconsistent. It's like another, it's another step towards uh, data democratization, right? Correct. Okay. And like, uh, and then... Yes. Uh, well, data democratization goes beyond that. I would say that this is simply data accessibility. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my opinion, like uh, real data accessibility requires a lot more flexibility from the end user side. And that is achieved through tools that uh, really provide more of a flexible access. My tool of choice uh, is uh, Luca. I really like Luca because it has like a, this centralized governance model. 
in which we can simply pack and model all this knowledge required to, to uh, exploit the data. So all the various metrics definition or the, the relationship between the tables, like and all the business rules that needs to be applied. You know, like even if you need to calculate the number of customers that you have, you know, depending on what assumptions you make, you could get 10 different numbers. No? So it's either that every, every person knows by heart every single rule and exception, or uh, you know you find a way to centralize them, and that's why I I use uh, I pick Looker as my tool of choice. But there are other tools who do quite a good job at that too. Microsoft Power BI does a decent job at that too. And uh, ironically, the, the old school tools as, uh, that I mentioned before, such as MicroStrategy and Business Object, did a good job at that too, like some 15 years ago. But then they got replaced by you know technologies such as click view and MicroStrategy, sorry, click view and Tableau, because people found them more attractive and because they were in memory, so they went faster. Uh, but we didn't really understand what we were trading off. You know, so we just basically traded off flexibility, traded off accessibility for speed. And that was uh, uh, actually a very sad trade off and a very inconvenient one, in my opinion. But fortunately, database is caught up nowadays and they're faster and they're columnar and there is like awesome technologies like um, Snowflake, BigQuery, just to name a couple that uh, uh, provide a sufficient performance uh, to enable users to query data on the fly. And so we can go back to those kind of centralized, flexible access to data. Yes, I think, I think that the the is the like the sim the simplicity in which uh, uh, you can make a big data <laughs> data warehouse and uh, not worry about a lot of the you know about the logistics and uh, and you can simply start small and scale up with solutions like uh, bigquery and uh, snowflake um i think that's uh, tremendous as someone who also have done this before and uh, had to you know, spend a lot of energy around uh, engineering the data and uh, making it scale. And all of a sudden you can make queries that you never dreamed to do uh, mm -hmm. on the uh, big data without having to, you know, to manipulate and engineer your way through it. I think that's a great time to, to be alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would uh, uh, fully agree on the technology side of things and especially on uh, UX, uh, meaning that, you know, uh, modern database uh, and the first one I can remember that really made such a big difference was uh, Redshift. Uh, basically, they allowed you, they combined, you know, the capability of managing massive amount of data that uh, previous platforms such as Hadoop had with the UX that Hadoop did not provide. So you would have the UX of a standard database, doesn't really look too different from an Oracle or a SQL server, but you would get uh, big data, uh, heavy lifting capability. And that was a really uh, a game changer. I also agree completely with you on the scaling capability, like scaling right now is uh, as simple as hitting a button, or sometimes you don't even have to scale in because you're dealing with serverless application. So in this sense, it's a very exciting uh, uh, moment to be alive, as you said. On the other hand, I am a, a quite a detractor of uh, uh, those kind of approaches in which we just uh, pretend that uh, pre-processing data is not uh, necessary and we can just go and uh, uh, query uh, non-aggregated data uh, without any previous uh, processing. Uh, I found that uh, both uh, inconvenient because you're going to end up doing the processing over and over and over again in every single query that you do to consolidate and clean your data on one hand. And on the second hand, you will not have the chance to uh, consolidate, clean up, and uh, govern this data previously. So in my opinion, like on a, from a technological point of view and scaling point of view, that is absolutely true. Whereas uh, there is still a very strong, important, 
and uh, uh, unescapable need for uh, uh, wrangling and processing your data up front. Right. Um, right, especially when it's uh, pulled in a systematic way in either uh, like a production environment where uh, you're making use of the data and uh, and uh, and uh, you know making all the calculation from raw data and aggregations doesn't uh, doesn't cut it or sometimes it's also not cost efficient uh, like when you you need to scan a lot of data even if it's even if it's cheap if it, even if it's cheap and it's doable it's uh, uh, when it happens every second or several times every second and it uh, uh, it doesn't cut it yeah definitely but uh, getting but still getting from zero to uh, insights uh, is very quick nowadays. Much simpler than it used to be, yes. Much quicker than it used to be, for sure. So if if uh, someone is uh, starting their career and they, they want to, you know, to get into the exciting world of uh, data and data engineering, uh, what would you recommend them, you know, from your experience? Um, what would I recommend them to do? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, what I observed right now is uh, this huge amount of uh, people who join data boot camps uh, or join courses or uh, small degrees, uh, and uh, you know they try to uh, they pretend to become uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning experts. Um, given that it's so fashionable nowadays. And, uh, you know, if I had a penny for each application that I got from an inexperienced machine learning engineer, I would be a millionaire now. Uh, and unfortunately, I keep having zero use for them. Very, very zero use. So uh, beware of those false promises of these boot camps and courses that are going to make you a machine learning data scientist in three months six months or even in a couple of years possibly <laughs> this is like it's a very very difficult job that requires a huge investment uh, and people who do these kind of things properly are people who dedicate their entire lives to it and possibly study like a degree and uh, got a phd afterwards and are proficient in statistics and they have uh, uh, software engineering skills uh, and this is not something that somebody who's been selling cheese until the previous week can just do after taking a course. Uh, so my uh, my mm, my recommendation would be having realistic expectations when it gets to this kind of roles, and at the same time also having like a realistic expectation on what the actual job looks like, because in my opinion, it's not like as a fraction as exciting as uh, people picture it, to be honest. Um, in terms of uh, uh, other roles, uh, like uh, I would say that uh, uh, I would recommend anybody to gain a broad understanding of the data landscape because it's very big and varied and it gets more specialized by the day. And so like, uh, the job of a data person can be extremely different. It's not the same uh, somebody like you, Ben, that you work with security. It's not the same what you do. Then somebody works with AI, then somebody works in business analytics, or somebody who does data engineering or data warehousing. It's completely different and it requires a different set of skills. So uh, I think the biggest piece of advice is uh, doing this prep work and make a very educated decision of what kind of per data person you want to be before just jumping into it based on uh, what you read on blogs uh, and uh, you know and webinars and see on webinars sorry i was on mute uh, that's the you know the sentence of 2020 and we're in 2021 uh, but uh, i was on mute uh, so so basically <laughs> Uh, to sum it up, you're saying, uh, first of all, get to know the different uh, subsets within uh, the data industry. Uh, that's one. And prepare for 
a long and don't go there because it's uh, you know it's uh, something that sounds great understand that it's really speaking to you because that's what you're going to do and prepare for a, a, a substantial investment in time don't expect magic to happen and just because we said that everything is easy now that you can do select star from it's not going to be easy in uh, actually solving business challenges Correct. Uh, well, I mean, there are like uh, uh, roles that have uh, more or less of a barrier at the entrance of it. Uh, what I was saying, like, you know, it's extremely difficult and it's going to take you forever is that, you know, uh, I was discussing really those kind of machine learning driven roles that really require deep uh, statistical knowledge and software engineering skills and so on and so forth. You know, those are like uh, very demanding roles. And then like uh, there are other roles that are more accessible. Um, you know, like if you want to become a business analyst, if you have like a, a very strong business mindset, you know, just with excellent PowerPoint, you can go like a very, very long way if you're curious and if you have the right mindset. So in that case, the barrier is not as strong. Having said that, it is very important. Every single of this role, it's a different uh, role, it's different job, requires different skills. So before jumping into any of these roles, make sure that you're gonna like it and make sure you know that uh, the kind of stuff that you're gonna have to learn are motivating to you. Uh, cool, and to a different topic, uh, you mentioned uh, security and um, what's, like, how do you see the balance between uh, or the work between data and security in, uh, you know, in, in today's data world? Mm. Well, I would imagine that uh, it depends a lot on uh, the scale of the company you're working in. Uh, in my case, uh, since uh, I like to specialize uh, in uh, uh, startups and especially I love taking startup and scaling the data function for them. You know, uh, these kind of companies, uh, normally like series A companies, they don't really have as much of a strict requirement for security as a huge corporation, maybe. Imagine if you are a bank, imagine if you are Banco Santander here in Spain, you know, then of course, like security is a very, very big deal. Or if you are like a, a, a health company, you know, that would be like extremely uh, big deal, you know. Uh, in a, so the biggest uh, factor that it may gonna make a, a difference is uh, the industry and the stage the company is in. In the kind of company which I move, it all comes down to a very basic, uh, set of simple best practices and that's what my recommendation would be uh, i mean this is a problem that is as old as uh, uh, information technology i was i'm sure that like 50 years ago uh, they were already very much concerned with security you know especially banks and the like so uh, there has been a lot of people look into that a lot of very, very smart people put a lot of work into understanding how to best secure your system and your data. So why reinventing the wheel? Uh, there is a, such a huge literature out there of established best practices that are known to work. So I think my recommendation is simply drawing from there. And you might realize that by applying some very simple principles that really are little more than common sense you can probably you can bring your company in a very good place already mm -hmm. right? and i'm referring to basic principles and concepts such as you know if something is very sensitive simply don't store it unless you really need it. or uh, you know or if something i don't know if you are going to uh, store uh, HR data for your company, which is personal by definition. Mm -hmm. So maybe put it in a, in a separate database altogether so that you're minimizing the risk of anybody uh, accessing this data by mistake. Um, you know, and uh, so my, so yeah, to cut a long story short, I think there's like this very set, uh, this very basic set of principles, basic principles and best practices 
that can go a very long way. Right, I, I definitely agree with you. Um, uh, I think that one of the challenges is, uh, like you said, uh, the, when, when you're scaling and when you're scaling data usage um, uh, and you're opening access to more uh, people and you have more and more data coming from different sources, uh, I think that uh, this uh, kind of uh, complicates things. Uh, suddenly knowing where sensitive data is, who's touching it can get uh, complicated. Very much, yes. Yeah. And I would say as the company scales, it is very much so. Yeah. And also something that you mentioned, which is important, uh, you mentioned um, uh, that if you have uh, something very uh, sensitive, don't store it. Which is uh, which makes a uh, great sense, by the way. Uh, uh, I, I think that many companies uh, would say, "Why didn't we think about it?" Because in many cases, companies think that uh, you know data is uh, a resource, an asset. So let's keep everything. Um, yeah. But not keeping something may really uh, like if it doesn't provide value. It may be it it's, like a, a heritage. it's a heritage of the first uh, big data years. I remember like when big data was coming up, I think it was like 2010, 2012. There was always like, you know, since uh, storing data became cheap at the scale and before it was very expensive and it became cheap all in a sudden because the system started to run like how do run on a on commodity hardware. And so everybody like was blown away and said, oh, come on, let's just store everything, you know, and then we'll see what to do it later. And this became like a common practice. I wonder why, I wonder where it came from, but that's what everybody did. So it was just collecting data of all kinds in F3. It was only uh, recently and then people realized, oh, wow, if I collect all this data, then I have to be worried about the security concern that it represents. Uh, and more often than not, this data is not quite uh, useful or uh, sometimes there are like very simple uh, uh, measures that you can take to secure it. Uh, a very simple example, uh, in a data warehousing context, a user name, last name, email address, is completely useless. What are you going to do with it? So uh, at the time of ingestion, you know, okay, if you are a, in a CRM system, yes, of course, I'm going to email people, but like generally speaking, you know, uh, what's the point of having this information in your data warehouse in the first place? And if you want to use your email address as, an, uh, uni as a unique ID for your customer, fine, you can always hash it. You know, those are like very, very simple things that can be done uh, to at least mitigate uh, security risks. Uh, cool. Uh, what, what's on your learning bucket list like? What technologies do you want to learn? Uh... Oh, wow, my technology bucket list. Uh, lately, like, uh, I, I have been like, uh, there's a new generation of tools uh, for uh, uh, data engineering and data warehousing uh, that are super interesting. Uh, I would say I would mention two. Uh, there are tools such as uh, DBT, Great Expectations, Monte Carlo, which uh, are uh, coming up promin prominently in the landscape at the moment. And I think they have a huge potential. And uh, it's all about, uh, well, they're different beasts, but they have like quite a, a bit of an overlap. I really like uh, DBT because it's uh, uh, complementing uh, uh, SQL and uh, uh, enabling uh, new use cases, which before were impossible due to the language uh, limitation. For instance, you know, you cannot really do loops uh, in uh, SQL or you really cannot do parameterized queries in SQL alone. And so DBT is uh, empowering all this and it's gaining, it's gaining more and more traction. So I started playing a little bit with it, but I would like to go deeper in it. Uh, another side of uh, what DVD does is a lineage that allow you to uh, understand uh, uh, upstream and downstream dependencies. So if you are in a pipeline or a data warehouse and say, what if this table is broken, 
what other tables are going to be broken, right? And then uh, a similar tool, which uh, I adopted at Preply, I'm very satisfied with, is a tool called uh, Monte Carlo, which does these uh, lineage and uh, data quality checks uh, with uh, a very uh, uh, convenient uh, graphical user interface, which really removes uh, the need for technical skills and allows you to uh, detect uh, anomalies in your data and uh, you know detect anomalies and also dependencies um, and lastly uh, great expectations is another tool i would like to look into better but i understand that it allows you to set a whole bunch of rules that you expect to be met when your data is in a good place and then it would uh, raise alarms when it isn't okay cool um so last question is what you think the biggest challenges in data engineering or data operations will be in the next three to five years like in the near future <laughs> or in the next near future <laughs> <laughs> i remember reading this uh question on the document that you share with me <laughs> thinking about it 10 minutes and not coming up with a reasonable answer <laughs> Well, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but I think like uh, as uh, uh, as data warehousing evolves more and more, and uh, you know there is always more and more complexity to be resolved in order for data to be exploitable. Um, and by complexity, I don't really mean volume. I don't really mean speed, but I mean functional complexity uh, all the information that somebody needs to know in order to exploit data correctly and efficiently and i think this is being overlooked greatly at the moment and i see a lot of tools say hey here's my new database and i'm 10 times faster and i'm like dude i don't really need any more speed you know i got plenty of speed i got enough my queries uh, last uh, three seconds i don't want to go down to sub seconds simply because i don't care you know, but on the other hand, I have the problem that, uh, you know, my data warehouse is so complicated that it takes uh, 10 data scientists only to pull the most basic data. You know, and I don't really see uh, any tools other than BI tools and again, possibly tools like Looker and uh, similar that are doing uh, any progress in this sense of like resolving these functional difficulties. So it's so it's more or less uh, getting to know the data that you have and understanding what uh, value you can uh, get from it, something. Yeah, I want to say that uh, uh, it's more about, I'll give you an example to make it clear. I used that one before. So how many customers do I have? So I can go into my customer table and do count star. And I'm going to get, okay, so that's the number of customers. Oh, no, wait, here I have three users. So I have to remove the three users. Okay, I remove the three users. I have the number of customers. Oh, no, wait, there's people who are from my own company. So I have to remove people who have a preply.com address. Oh, no, wait, there are those who are not paying. Oh, no, oh, wait, there are those, all these exceptions and all of that. Each time I have to make a query to calculate the number of customers, I have to know all of this. Now, where does this information sit? Where is it? In the head of uh, the analyst doing the query. And if you have 20 analysts, it's 20 heads. And how are you going to train that? And how is that going to scale? So in my opinion, there is like this challenge for information management and data governance management. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, uh, I see very few tools uh, who are moving in that direction. OK, awesome. And uh, do you have anything else you want to you know, you want to share or? Uh... Well, I just want to thank you very much for uh, your time today and for the opportunity to have this very enjoyable chat. I hope you enjoyed too. <laughs> I, I enjoyed, and, uh, yeah. I yeah, fun. I'm really happy, happy to see that, uh, you know, uh, we're seeing progress in, uh, uh, in uh, this discipline uh, of security. And uh, I like to see this concept of data security operations because I never heard it before which uh, takes me, uh, gives me hope that we're finally getting more structured and more professionalized at the time of uh, uh, addressing this problem. 
Yeah, so the way I see it, uh, uh, the way I see it is uh, that um, you can you can see that uh, more or less the way things that uh, happened around applications and uh, uh, and application delivery when the application started moving to the cloud, um, uh, like the DevOps revolution, revolution or evolution or whatever you want to call it. Um, Something like that is uh, happening uh, with data as well. Uh, a lot of data moved to the cloud. You mentioned some of the technologies. We, we spoke about some of these technologies that enable you to make more use of your data. Uh, so your BI tools went to the cloud. I, uh, Looker uh, is, uh, you know, SaaS. Uh, your data warehouses and, uh, and data lakes are uh, in the cloud and elastic and more data is uh, pouring in. And uh, and data is also changing in a more rap rapid way. I, I don't know about your organization, but uh, in many organizations, there are many people who are putting data in the uh, many more people putting in data, and especially more people reading data. So more uh, changes in the data, and I think that this uh, also needs to change the way uh, security is uh, integrated with uh, data, especially when there are large uh, number of data users security needs to be a first class citizen from design uh, to monitoring and all throughout the way that's basically the two minute pitch of why data psychops is important um, <laughs> okay uh, so uh, again thank you very much alessandro and uh, okay. thank you for your time bye bye yes. okay have a great day i hope we can speak soon